Hello and welcome to this, the Crypto Club and Digital Assets Weekly Catch-Up on Zoom. It is Sunday the 9th of June 2024, and as is always the case, we never quite know what we're going to be talking about. Topics vary each week depending upon who comes along, but quite often we'll talk about blockchain, DeFi, NFTs, the metaverse, CBDCs, any other regulatory developments or legal uh, progress. We sometimes talk about specific projects, and we also chat generally about the main cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dash. Hope you enjoy this. Uh, do come and join us in a future session. We hold these every Sunday evening, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Joining details in the link below. With that, let's see who's going to come and join us today. Hey, Eric, good morning to you, or good afternoon. Good morning. Um, it's, it's actually morning for me. Hey, good morning to you. Not spoken to you for a few weeks, Eric. How are you keeping? Uh, yeah, I've been I've been through the ringer, but um, and every you know, like on Sundays is my time to sleep in. Uh, so I then miss your show, which I'm very disappointed to do. But I'm like, oh damn, I missed the show. Ah. This morning I woke up earlier, so. Okay, well that's good. It's, it's been quiet for the last couple of weeks anyway. I think as the weather's been getting a little bit warmer in Europe. Then yeah. people have been enjoying the later evenings and that kind of thing. So, so you've not missed that much. I'm. Um, I I would have thought that you know, given that you've been doing this so consistently for as long as you have, that by now the group would have um, grown quite substantially because mm -hmm. crypto's coming back into, you know, it's a fad, right? Uh, it, and then it it fades away, but then it comes back. You're right, and I think every time Bitcoin starts heading towards seventy thousand dollars, that's usually when people start waking up and they get excited and that. So you're right; it's it's definitely in waves. And maybe maybe I should make the effort to um, build up the regular attendance on this a little bit more. That'd be good. Yeah, I used to um, I used to be more active in a thing called um, oh my goodness, I even forgot what it's called now. It was some kind of voice only thing and i think i even deleted the app from my phone i did so there was, uh, there was, was a clubhouse clubhouse chance. yes yeah that that was it i used to uh i used to be invited to to join a lot of clubhouses and it was a quite active um mm -hmm. platform um including for crypto so i and i you know speak and i'd get lots of big audiences but it just got, you know, crypto was boring for a time. Yep. Yeah. I think um, the platforms go through phases as well, don't they? That yeah. Cl 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 Clubhouse was very popular when it was first launched. But if I remember yes. correctly, it was mainly for Apple devices, which made it quite restrictive. And That's it, right. It was because it was restrictive. Some people quite liked it, whereas I didn't because I wasn't using an Apple device. So. Um, and then... You, there's a lot of interest these days in Twitter spaces or X spaces. Yes, that's, I was just on a, I was just on a call last weekend. In fact, with a friend of mine, Peter, uh, oh Fred uh, Kruger, and he he has just blown up in terms of following uh, you know, on X. Mm -hmm. He started posting. You know, I think he had. He's a he's a scientist. Uh, but came from Wall Street. Uh, so he's got a science background, but he, he spent all his time in Wall Street. And he, he was with like uh, Bear Stearns back in the day and uh, uh, what were they called? Uh, uh, Drexel Burnham. Mm -hmm. um, and so he started, you know, s speaking and his perspective, having the sort of the insider track on Wall Street was appealing. And all of a sudden it's just like, wow, you got a big following. So he's now doing spaces. Okay. And I decided to, I'd, I'd listened to a couple of his shows. I decided to speak on one of them. And my opening my mouth gave me more followers on X than, uh, than anything else I've posted. Okay. Mm. Uh, maybe, maybe I should try uh, running one of these sessions on X then. That would be quite interesting. Yeah. I mean, certainly I would attend it and, and uh, share it. Um, it's uh, I mean, it's, the thing is that this Zoom call you would attend only if you knew about it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there's no really way of knowing about it. I don't even know how I found out. Um, and and I only remember it because I have it on the calendar. Mm -hmm. Right. But that's uh, a very limited set. 
you're right. And so that's why what I tend to do is that there are certain um, WhatsApp groups and Telegram groups and Signal groups that I'm a member of. And so I'll sometimes put a note out on some of those and also uh, a, couple yeah. of Facebook, a couple of Facebook groups as well. But you're right that the thing that used to appeal about X spaces was the fact that if, if you had the software that told you what what um, chats were currently live, you could join in on any of them. Whereas on a Zoom call, you have to know it's there. So you, you're yeah. absolutely right on that. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. The other thing that I would recommend is uh, you could you could make a series of short videos to post on uh, TikTok. Mm -hmm. And then you redirect mm -hmm. your your audience to X. Yeah, so, so I, I, I actually built up a TikTok channel. Um, I, I grew it quite rapidly up to several thousand um, okay. followers. Um, and then for some reason I got banned. And I, I, don't, ah. I, don't, I don't know to this day why I was banned. Because with, with TikTok, they just ban you. They don't tell you yeah. why. And they don't give you a right of appeal. And it was like, hang on, hang on. I've just spent a few months like building up several thousand followers. And I, I used to do um, TikToks of, a, of anything between 15 seconds or a minute. Yeah, practically, it's perfect. Exactly. Yeah, pr 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 practically every day, um, just a little bit about the crypto space in some way. And then started linking them in. And it was great. You know, some, some of them would kind of go viral and you get tens of thousands of views from it. And it's like, Ooh, that was interesting. Um, and then all of a sudden, I just got a notice through one day of um, you've breached our community guidelines. You're banned. Mm. It's like, where? What did what did I do? What did I say? I think oh, I've no idea. Yeah. I uh, really uh, hate that shit. I hate the fact that there there isn't like an actual human to like a reasonable human to have a conversation about because. Yeah. You look at these community guidelines and and they say whatever they say and you and you think well which of these things did I ban? No, tell mm -hmm. me which which thing I did right that I've uh, no. So um, exactly. So then after a while you're just deterred from using the platform because uh, it kind of depends, right? Like if if your intention is to build a following, then you're very much hostage to the fucking platform. Yeah. If you're yeah. if the content on the platform is great and you're just a voyeur like I am on TikTok, you know I don't post anything on TikTok. I just watch because there's so much stuff to watch that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. Then it's fine because if they for whatever reason they close your account, you just open another one. Who cares? Yeah. But well, uh, I had that situation happen to me on LinkedIn where uh, I think at some point in the middle of the COVID hysteria. I said something that was anti-COVID, and mm. boom, I got banned. Yep. And the the thing was, they said, "Well, we'll let you back in if you provide us with your passport." And I'm like, "Fuck you! I'm not giving you my passport. What the hell, right?" I um, and so for months and months, I just I'm like, I just wrote it off. I deleted the app. I don't care. Fuck them, and I had I had a, be a very large following, right? And then at some point, I thought, well, you know, I give my passport to just about anybody anyway, right? Because mm -hmm. they all demand the damn passport, all the banks and all the various institutions. So okay, I'll give them the passport. I got back my my LinkedIn account, and I still have, you know, I still have a large, a quite large audience. But I mean, I have like twenty thousand people following. Okay, so it's not that large, but. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I really wonder the value of it because I, po I post almost every day, right? And I repost tons of stuff. And, and I get approached every day by um, probably 10 to 20 people, okay. you know, so I accept everyone. And I send them out a message with a link to one of my videos, etc., and the kind of engagement that I got is that I get is so minimal. In, in fact, I get guys to write me and I reply to them and then they don't write me back. Two or three years later, they write me again with some spam like, oh, I thought you'd like to see this, right? 
and so I I don't I don't really know what uh, you know I don't know the worth of it. But but that's where I mean that, this is where it starts linking in with uh, the crypto space and blockchain and that that there have been efforts at making uh, social media platforms that are decentralized and run on, on blockchain basis. Because one, yeah. one of the things one of the things I find frustrating exa exactly as you say. I've I've got a not dissimilar following on LinkedIn to yours, um, which has been cultivated over the years and everything. And I really dislike the fact that I do not own it. So yeah. if if I got banned, I, I lose access to my network. And, yeah, exactly. And I, if I want to choose to post something in a particular way, then I carry the risk of being being thrown off the platform. Um, and it might be a, I've, I've said something that there's, there's nothing illegal, wrong, or anything like that. It's just that it's a, a different perspective from what whatever the social media platform has decided is correct. So th th this is why I think there's real opportunity for um, a, a, a decentralized social media platform. We, we, we were talking about this a few weeks ago. Um, there's obviously there's a couple of things which are Ethereum-based. Um, but there hasn't been that much that's come through yet. So, so we've just been joined by Eric and Elena. Just want to say hi to them. Hello, hi. Elena. Yeah. Hello, Eric. Hello, Gary and everyone. Yeah, yeah. and so we had things like, you may remember Steemit. And St Steemit was a social media platform, which yes, seems, I remember. Seems, seems to have gone very quiet. I'm not quite sure what's happened with that now. Um, well, you know, the guy who uh, founded that was the guy who went on to build EOS. And EOS was a big drama. You know, I think he probably was uh, embittered by the whole experience because he was incredibly successful. And then he was he was shot down and basically destroyed. Right. So, um, I yeah, I used to post on Steemit as an alternative to Medium because uh, mm -hmm. Medium's a really nice platform. Um, it's a little too restrictive, right? But there is good content on it. But I didn't, I didn't want to be, again, held hostage to, to one platform. So Steam, it was great. And I think the problem is, like, there are, I think there are certain uh, platforms out there that are really community-driven. Like, mm -hmm. for example, um, uh, Stack Overflow. Um, so when you look at LinkedIn, they say, oh, community guidelines, but it's not the community. It's the, co it's a corporation mm -hmm. and it's policies and it's agendas, right? So they decide, okay, anything that is, that is related to COVID that doesn't align with the narrative is misinformation. And I can where is the community who decided that? No, it's, it's mm -hmm. a corporation. Yeah. But even in really community-driven platforms like Stack Overflow, which I was a great fan of for a long time, it's become so militant that it, it becomes useless. You know, I ask, mm. I ask, and it's usually a technical question, right? So they, they have certain guidelines like you're not supposed to ask for, you, you're not supposed to solicit for opinions on, on solutions, Right. But the reality is that that is that's a very fine line, and uh, and half the time it's very useful to do that, mm -hmm. um, and yet they always close your posts and they they demerit you and and all this kind of stuff. And so across time, I just stopped using it. It's like you know, I, every time I ask something, someone's going to object about something, and there's not even any feedback as to why. What's wrong with the question? Yeah. So, well, quite frustrating, so isn't it? Sorry, it's like I'll, committing suicide, right? Because you you close the doors off to your users, and so then they don't come. Yeah, I, I was thinking no, no one seems to have cracked it yet. Sorry, I just want to come back and say hi hi to Elliot who's joined us as well. I, I wondered if Elliot wanted to just say hello back. Hey Gary, hey Alan, hey Eric. Uh, I'm uh, I've, I've known James for a while. I've been seeing your guys' posts in the digital economy all chats. <clears throat> and popped in uh, just after a quick workout. I'll say hi real fast. Um, but yeah, I know I, I remember Steam it back in the days, 2018 time frame. Uh, yes, they were one of uh, the the better groups, but 
you know, from that 2017, 2018 vintage, um, intentions were uh, high, but structuring and execution and ability to actually know what was being done and how it was being done uh, correctly. And, and granted, there was no real framework. It was really hard to build these things. Mm -hmm. It was very low, <laughs> as, as we all know. So it was, it was tough to, you know, it was the, those early experiments were really tough to have any staying power. And I guess, you know, the question here is, are things like uh, Farcaster, I don't know, I, some, someone told me friend tech was already like cringe worthy, like you couldn't use it. I mean, it's wild that things move so fastly. Nine months ago, friends tech was like the hottest thing. And now people are, are like, oh God, cringe. I can't believe you said that. Um, it's like, it's like the, the friends reunited of 2024. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. But, so, yeah. but you're right. We were talking about Farcaster a few weeks ago, because that that seems to be a contender on the social media thing. And I, I saw actually they they just did I think it was a Series B raise recently, which uh, if, if you look at their total valuation, it values them at over a billion dollars, which makes them a unicorn. Which for, for a, a, a social networking platform is impressive, but then. I remember. Well, is when, it going to be another clubhouse? I mean, well, that was. Well, well we, we were talking about that exactly that before. That clubhouse was one of these really meteoric, rising, shining lights that ju just fell off the edge of a cliff somewhere. You know, I, I'm not quite sure how it happened. But you, you get this a lot with social media things. I, I remember when LinkedIn IPO'd, um, which I think it was probably around about the 2017 ish mark, if I remember correctly, maybe a bit longer. But that, that was interesting because Link, LinkedIn IPO'd at the same time as a commodities trading company IPO'd, a company called Glencore, who, if anyone's worked in the oil industry or the commodities industry, Glencore is absolutely massive. You know, one of, and the, you know they, they've got mining facilities, they've got oil pipelines, they've got all sorts of physical infrastructure in that. And I remember Glencore and LinkedIn IPO'd at the same time. And Glencore's IPO kind of tanked. And it's like, but well, they've got all this physical infrastructure, real business and everything. And LinkedIn's IPO did really well. And it's like, but LinkedIn is a social media platform. There's no actual physical product or anything. So it's, that just kind of blew me away. But yeah, you're right again. There's, there seems to be quite a short half-life of most social media platforms that they, they kind of thrive and die. And it, it'll be interesting because it, there's things like, is it Akash, um, Akasha, DTube, there's a few others I just noticed now. And I think the one we mentioned before, Farcaster, if I remember correctly, they're just short of half a million subscribers, which in social media speak is tiny these days. You think about when, what, what was the, um, the Instagram spin-off product that I don't even use, Threads. So th th Threads was the meta product, which was meant to be the competitor. Yeah. Products. Well, I mean, Twitter killed them all, right? With Twitter yeah. spaces. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's it's what it's wild about. because they've been, there are so many Web3 programs that come up to me and say, Elliot, I've got the best platform. I just need the network. And... <laughs> I I hate to chuckle, but it's like that you then you really don't have anything. And then what they go to is they try to penetrate uh communities, like very, very passionate communities. Now that could be like cheerleading, or that could be like tattoos, that could be MMA, that could be karate combat. Um, and they try to penetrate and get get that critical mass from that, but Man, it's it's really, really, really hard. So, wh where about you based then, Elias? I'm in New York. Okay, so we've got both sides of the states covered because um, Eric is over on the west coast. I used to live in, in New York um, thirty years ago. I lived on um, in Soho. I'm um, on Ninth and Broadway. Ninth and Broadway. Okay, yeah. So I was. Um, 
I, I I don't know if uh, if this story is still there. It was called Bal Balducci's, I think it was called. Balducci is still there. It's still there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was. Uh, it was. I mean, it, my time in New York was wonderful. Uh, it was such an active, connected society. You know, uh, whereas LA is such a big. This is wasteland. Everything, everything yeah. is so far, and no one connects with anybody. And it's just, um, <laughs> well, but well, you, you I, get I, I, to it after a while. I, I went to UCLA, so I, I know the area well, ah. and I'll never forget the Dodgers were playing in the World Series, and I was on the west side, and my friend was in on the east, like he was east of downtown LA. And we were trying to meet at four o'clock to watch the game, and we just couldn't do it. Right? It's just like, <laughs> you, sorry, we're we're so far, yeah. we're so close, but we're so far away logistically. We just we won't be able to make that happen. So yeah, you know, yeah it's, it's, it's like that because it was the first city designed after the invention of the automobile, which is why there's so much fall. But I, I, I thought oh. the I, I thought the crypto nice. cap, capital in the U.S. these days is Austin, Texas. Because every, everyone I speak to in the crypto space seems to be in Texas these days. <laughs> yeah, it's really uh, popular. Lots of Californians have left for Texas. I, I feel like the exodus from the New Yorks to Puerto Rico, Miami, and Austin were definitely real, but I think it's it's died down a lot. You know, I heard like that Miami. Uh, they had one thirty seventh of the capital invested in Miami than they did a year ago, um, oh, and wow. I was just in Austin for consensus. And yes, it was very busy and it was very packed, uh, and it was a great vibe. And the conference was an important uh, signal for for U.S. because last year it was dreadful. Um, but I still didn't get the Austin core, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Maybe we'll come back to consensus in a minute because I'm always interested in learning what actually went on at the conference. I just want to say, I noticed we just got someone joined, got the name Mowgli's Bush Telegraph, which sounds like fun. You going to say hi? Hi there. Um, greetings. I'm actually traveling. I'm in London now, but normally based in Zurich. You, you look like you're underneath an airplane wing at the moment with that background. <laughs> no, just randomly, sort of. Oh, locked okay. in okay cool so no, i'm Excellent. just traveling in the moment in london for three four days but normally i'm in zurich uh okay. that's where i'm based but what, what, what's your area of interest then mowgli uh family office investing into dfi businesses then also mental health and companies around the future of work so i have eight companies at the moment in dfi so, yeah but really looking at financial inclusion in all shapes and forms you say you know so zurich, zurich do you say you're normally Zurich based? Yeah. Okay. Because again, that that's something of a bit of a crypto capital, although Zug, I guess, is even even more so in some ways. Yeah. Um, uh, technically, I'm Zug based, uh, where the okay. family office is based. Because uh, I guess was it Crypto Valley Associates that kind of dominated Zug? Was that yeah, the they were there. There's the biggest event they had last week as well. A lot of people flying in. Okay. Actually. Several people who've been to consensus were there, and a number of family offices from Singapore, Hong Kong. Is it the whole family office space I find interesting because I I get involved in crypto custodial capabilities, and I'm seeing a growth around family offices about well, when you are investing into crypto assets, how do you ensure they're secured in some way? And, and how they manage safely in that. So an, an interesting thing. I just wanted to open that book up then that, that there was mention of consensus there. For, for anyone who went or heard about it, was it, was there any particular interesting stories from that? Any new developments going on? Um, I've been, this was my seventh consensus. Um, so I actually wrote some observations, which I'll, I'll re re repeat here. Uh, on it, um, you know, first first was uh, compared to last year, it was the environment and the energy was much better. I think the U.S. political environment is uh, transitioning from hostile to neutral and dare I say 
positive. I won't say positive. I'll say, dare I say positive. And so, uh, but while we were there, you had uh, Biden veto SAB 121, and then you had Trump guilty on all 34 accounts. So it's like been this roller coaster, but it, it is notable because so many of our companies want to have some regulatory framework, i.e. like Amica, like what's happening in the UAE, uh, but we don't, and it's frustrating. Uh, but FIT, uh, FIT21 uh, seems to be moving forward. And if we do, if this time next year, we actually have a US regulatory framework, it's, it's definitely gonna be game on out here. Um, other thing I noticed was a lot of founders were already saying that the next downward cycle is going to begin in 12 months. I'm more in the 18 to 24 month camp, but, uh, you know, we've, we've probably had six months in this, dare I say, bull cycle. Uh, already people are talking about the next downturn and what can they do in this next upturn? So I thought it was going to be 18, 24. More people were telling me 12. That's <laughs> that's notable. Uh, largest bull case I heard, BTC, at 1.5 million US dollars by 2030. That was uh, Kathy Wood's uh, BTC bull case. Okay. Uh, we still have a lot of noise. Uh, and particularly with the meme coins, I mean, oh my God, it's it's... Uh, I, and I've been through the ICO, you know, ridiculousness. I went through the, you know, all the other ridiculous, but the meme coins are just terrible. I mean, what, what are we doing? Everything's like dollar sign, three or four letters. And it's just really difficult. You can't take them seriously. I try to, but mm -hmm. it's just painful. And they make a lot of noise and that noise attracts a lot of the attention and it's disappointing. I, I get why we have to do it, and it's experimentation, but that part sucks. Um, but every institution was there. I think uh, almost 100% of the institutions were there. They're very difficult to find uh, on purpose, but they are all there. Uh, the worst thing I heard was LRT BTC L2, liquid restaking on a Bitcoin layer two. Like, this is not going to end well. Like, what are we doing here? Um, and uh, yeah, I think yeah. it's just a opportunism, right? It isn't really so much exploratory because there's no there's no innovation there. It's just all marketing and hype. Yeah, and who like, you can you can take people's money for nothing. That's that's all it is. I but you know I tell I pay, tell people all the time like if you're not you you can't fake being in our industry, but you can definitely get faked out if you're not. And we need the meme coin. We need the BTC, or the LR, LRT BTC L2 ridiculousness. Like people don't understand what is right and what is real and what is not. Yeah. And we, not that I'm on a high horse and I know everything, but some of this stuff that's getting a lot of the attention is not going to end well. Mm. And how do we navigate the industry away from some of this stuff? I, I don't This know, This goes to Gary's earlier point about how the LinkedIn IPO did so well and some oil firm didn't that had a lot of infrastructure, right? It's, we, uh, we have a general tendency to go towards um, more like promises and a, mm -hmm. and a company with large infrastructure has a very solid uh, understanding of costs and especially the, the costs of expansion and growth. Whereas a company like LinkedIn has no idea of the of the, the growth, right? There's very little cost to growth, and it could just be. And so we we go for the things that aren't real. The memes promise. I mean, it's all pump and dump, right? They they all promise, promise, and that's what people hear. So they look at projects like Cosmos or Polkadot or things like, or even Vow, who are that are very real, and it's just not as exciting. It's funny, isn't it? It was mentioned before about the ICO craze, because I, I remember that in 2016, 17, 18, where there was this whole hype around getting investments into crypto firms through ICO raises. And a lot of that was ultimately people didn't have a clue, but it was a great way of making money. Or rather, it was a great way of some people making a lot of money and some people losing money. 
And then I saw a similar thing with the whole NFT craze where you had, you know, why is everyone buying these I, these images of Board 8 Yacht Club or what, whatever type thing and monkeys and that kind of thing? And again, it was just complete hype led. And now we've got it, as you, as you say, with the meme coins. And see, um, I think this one that's just been launched by is it Andrew Tate, who's a, a fairly well known. Oh, my gosh. A fairly <laughs> well known um, social media person, shall we say? Um, yeah, uh, and it, it's it's the whole hype thing again, and it, it's all celebrity led, endorsement led, you know. And this is where I think going back to Elliot's point about what what's needed, th this is where regulation um, will stifle innovation, or it might also preserve it because it it might reduce the froth in some ways because I've, I've always found it interesting because you're mentioning in europe mica before so you know mar marketing crypto crypto assets where they've put in place regulatory requirements around um transactions and kyc and all this kind of thing which has kind of put a legitimacy to it whilst also causing some stifling as well it, 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 it's reduced it Whereas in the states, you've got was it thirteen federal regulators, fifty state regulators, all of whom are trying to regulate crypto. You know, yeah. and, and you know, yeah, you, you have the battles between the CFTC, the SEC, that they're all trying to claim crypto as their domain. And you're exactly right. I think once you get regulatory clarity, and maybe some of the proposals going through Congress potentially. Um, might see some regulatory certainty, and that might actually help improve things. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I have a I have a perspective on this, which I've had for a long time, which is that we, as an industry, have done things all wrong. Um, when when the DAO first came to life, the idea of a DAO, the fact that so if you think about about it from first principles. Some some set of guys have an idea, they have some skills, they see a market opportunity, they need to organize amongst themselves. Okay. So traditionally, um, you would get a charter, right? You would go to the king and say, hey, we would like to form a company. And the, the king said, you put a stamp in there and they go, okay, fine. And as soon as... as as that was done, that company was a permissioned entity, right? So it was it was uh, to pay taxes and to abide by the rules of and and all of this kind of stuff. Well, the jurisdiction, which king is going to put the seal, right? The answer is mm -hmm. there isn't one. It's a blockchain contract, and and it allows us. It gives us the two things that companies give us, which is beneficial ownership and control over stuff. Mm -hmm. But it gives it gives both of these things to us in a, in a totally anonymous fashion. So, okay, absolutely wonderful. And that was early on. I mean, I, you guys remember the DAO, the, the first DAO, right? Yeah. And then we proceeded all these years after to ignore our very own amazing instrument and everything is a, like like over the years. The conversations were well. Is Malta better? Is Gibraltar better? Is uh, you know where is the right jurisdiction where the king is going to be friendly and where you know? And the answer is well. Wait, what? Why why are we playing that game? Get it uh, out. Uh, right? uh, uh, then you don't have to. You don't have to comply. So, so this is where I'm going to introduce Elena into the conversation uh, because she deals in a different jurisdiction these days, I believe, which is the metaverse. <laughs> no, so mm, okay. where, where, where does jurisdiction fit, Elena? Is that something you've had an opportunity to look at at all? Um, to be honest, not not so much. Okay. Because yeah. it, it's interesting of what, what governing law uh, manages and controls digital assets um, that are well. Their answer is, is 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 no no. There is no jurisdiction because jurisdiction isn't a thing over mechanisms. 
it's a thing over people, right? So mm -hmm. the United States government can pass any rules and those rules apply to its people that live in its territory. Mm -hmm. If an American citizen leaves the US and goes to France, then he's under French jurisdiction. And now the French can tell him what to do, right? So unless, unless so he's still using means, US dollars, <laughs> in which case yeah, he remains yeah, under US well, jurisdiction. Well, I mean, so Americans in particular remain under U.S. jurisdiction no matter where they are in mm -hmm. the world, right? It's it's one of two countries on the planet that does this so that you owe, you have to file tax returns and owe taxes to the U.S. from any any income source from anywhere. Okay, fine. I, you can, if you know, if you want to talk about jurisdictions, well, you can give up your, your citizenship in the U.S. if you really want to, mm -hmm. right? But the point is, the relationship between a king and his subjects remains a human affair. It's, it's, a, it's a person, not a machine, not a thing. There is no jurisdiction or a tractor. A tractor is just a thing, right? And a smart contract and, and a DAO is just a thing. Mm -hmm. So we, we can successfully escape the, the issue of jurisdiction. Now, the second question is, in order to form a company, and to go and do stuff, you need capital formation, right? And again, the DAO is an ideal vehicle for capital formation because it can be paid in some kind of token. So that leaves you only with the on-ramp issue, but you've already cleared all of the securities, uh, you know, interdictions and all of the, the money laundering stuff and all the shit, the, the, the surveillance apparatus that they throw at you, right? The answer is right there, but we haven't we haven't used it. Mm -hmm. So so this this business is ongoing. So tiresome business of the fucking regulators and oh now they're friendly now they're you know anti they like who cares? I don't even listen to this stuff. Well, it, it's interesting the, as well because the, the 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 DAO for those who don't know about it, it was it was. It was Pretty much one one of the first examples of a decentralized autonomous organization. So effectively, an entity that was managed by the community through smart contracts, and it um, had a bit of a glitch, shall we say, where the, the the theory was that it's the community and the software that makes all the decisions, and they argued, um, you know, code is law whereas lawyers will always argue that law is law and code is code. And so there was a situation, I think there was about $50 million was siphoned out at one point because yeah. someone, found, someone found an exploit of code, that sort of siphoned it out. And this is where I, I thought the DAO was a great example of an experiment that failed and therefore proved something. Uh, and in fact, it proved several things because the fact that it was one of the very few examples where Ethereum forked and rolled back um, and not by the majority kind of proved mm -hmm. it, that, that Ethereum wasn't decentralized for a start. Yeah. It, it had a central cabal. It proved as well the whole concept of blockchain being immutable was disproved because they actually rolled back some transactions. Um, and it, it proved about the whole thing about the integrity of it, the fact that it forked off. So I, I thought the DAO was a really good experiment because it failed and it, and it disproved some things. But we should really have learned some lessons from that, and we didn't because we, we could have then built on from that. But yeah, the, the it, implementation so, failed, yeah. but the concept uh, remains, right? And it is, it is still, in my mind, the most powerful concept on the planet today. But having it, digital money is wonderful, and it's, a, it's, it's almost secondary to having the capacity to organize ourselves. Yeah. Again, I, th I think it's one of these things where, that, that's what I love about the whole blockchain and crypto space. There is a lot of development in the infrastructure and the foundational level, but everyone gets distracted by the froth. So everyone's busy looking at, you know, oh, Bitcoin's gone up to 69,000, 70,000, 68, 71. Oh, my board eight yacht club meme has gone to this more of it. That, that, that to me is all froth. Whereas things like DAOs um, and some of the innovation around the blockchain space, I, I think is fascinating. It's just a shame we get distracted at times. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah.
Just, sorry, just no, just been joined by Nat. Hey, Nat. Oh, no, Nat's gone. See, sometimes you say people's names, they magically disappear. Um, yeah. So, so, so uh, Gary. Yeah. yeah. So you, you're saying DAO was a great experiment that failed. And it was very valuable to us because we learned, well, we g gained some important knowledge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you and think about what, the, co the, yeah. the, con the concept of science is that you have experiments and an experiment you learn from wh whether it works or it fails. It sometimes proves things, it sometimes disproves things. So Which I, is I, equally I, important. Exactly. And in, in the case of DAO failure, what do you think would be uh, the concept of an autonomous organization that we need and that will work? I, I'm going to answer that in a minute. I'm going to leave it to everyone else because my battery is running low and I just need to find my power lead. So ca carry on with that thought for a minute, folks. Keep talking. <laughs> so from, from my perspective, the, the single most important thing about blockchain or crypto is the ability to empower human beings to resist control from centralized sources, right? So um, when, we, when we think about, especially what, what has happened in the world in the last few years, um, the way in which these sort of unelected officials or sometimes elected but corrupt officials have uh, deployed the resources of their the very last, very vast resources of their governments against their own citizens, then it becomes ever so more relevant the idea of being able to resist. So how do you resist, right? Um, nominally, they've, they've built a system designed to prevent you from resisting called voting or democracy. So as long as you live under the the false notion that you can that you can vote you think that you're the master of your own destiny but in reality it's just uh it's just a ruse people keep voting and they keep getting the same stuff right it doesn't matter because who they can vote for is all sort of predetermined so crypto brings us an opportunity to do something different instead of exercising our will uh, with our voice, we do it with our feet. We can walk away because most of the power that we have is express expressible in terms of net worth. And we can now take our net worth and leave. Or we can protect our net worth, right? So the other, the other enormous development in the world is, is the ongoing destruction of the fiat systems which essentially rob us of our net worth. All the work that we've done in our lives and we've been smart and saved our pennies and they're just stealing it all. So, so from my perspective, Bitcoin and blockchain are a liberation tool. They liberate us from those people who are stealing from us and killing us. And I think this is a, this is a perspective that is frowned upon because it's essentially anarch anarchist. And even though the people who are suffering are aware of the fact that they're suffering, still they're so bought into the system that the first thing they want to know is, is it legal? That's the first question that I get all, you know, from everyone all the time. Is it legal? Everyone is so damn concerned about being properly permissioned. They don't remember anymore what it's like to be free. Right, and, and Bitcoin allows, it, Bitcoin prompts, it forces people to, to think about this very fact, and then it provides tools to actually become free. This well, is the, the, the thing. I don't think anyone challenges the, actual, the thought and the benefit of it. I think my head always goes to the adoption and the application of it. And yeah, Bitcoin has been transformative and will continue to be one of the most important technologies ever invented, where big blockchain is. Um, the problem is, though, is that a lot of people have gotten hacked and have lost a significant amount of assets. And, you know, who's... No, I, I don't think that's... I don't think... I mean, that is a problem, sure. Uh, and it's the, a and, huge I mean, problem. 
It's there are so problem. many People problems. People aren't right? asking if it's legal. They are, they're not saying, is it legal? Can I do it? Right? A lot not of now. it is, is, is it, if, if I put assets, if I put some of my wealth into it, for whatever reasons, like, can I depend on it being there? And mm. quite frankly, 95% of this world is not cut out for self-custody. We're just not. Agreed. Yeah, um, it's a, that, uh, I, was, I was going to quickly offer um, as well, Eric, I, I think this is a, a cultural thing as well around um, whether it's legal or not. Because what, what I find is that in, in some countries, you can do whatever you want as long as it's not illegal. Whereas in some countries, you can only do things that are legal. And That's it, correct. It, and it's, it's kind of fascinating. You, you operating around the world, you find some cultures where they won't do something unless there's a law allowing it. And in other countries, they'll do it unless there's a law preventing it. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's the difference between imperial law and common law, okay. right? But, um, yeah, I mean, so uh, I, I think to, to correct myself, I don't hear anyone asking whether Bitcoin is legal anymore, right? Because... It's been 12 years or 16 years, I think. Mm -hmm. And the fact that JP Morgan and all the banks are now buying it means it must be legal. So they stopped asking the question. Mm -hmm. But the, the point is that we have been accustomed to think in terms of permission. We are, we are permissioned creatures, right? And, and Bitcoin was a catalyst to, to wake up that consciousness and say, well, you know, uh, do I, why do I need permission to wipe my nose? And so, so to go back to the, the original question of, of the DAO and what its, its uh, potential uses are, is basically everything. Everything we do as humans, we do together. And we need organization. We need, you know, if you think about it, to organize a revolution against the government, it takes organization. Right, it takes people coming to uh, together, understanding that they hold the same perspectives, the same grudges, that there is the need for an agenda, what the agenda is going to be. All that kind of stuff requires communication. It requires mechanism, and the DAO is the mechanism to do this. Right, DAO is allowing you to create the problem with DAOs is, But when when it's all theoretically sounds good, right? But I mean, have you spoke? I've spoken with a number of DAOs recently, and the tenants in which it could be great also make it so it's very difficult to work, with, right? So who are the owners? Who are the responsible people that when you need to get something done or at, there is no one technically, right? Uh, and, and when you get into year one is great. When you get into year two, three, or four, and the incentives are not aligned as such where uh, there is a drive for some one person to carry the load for a whole other set of people, even though when you originally started out, everyone was supposed to be contributing. Life happens, things happen, and you have misaligned incentives. And then you get to a point where it's like, okay, who is, who's the person to talk to or who are the group of people that we should speak to about the DAO and what you're doing? And you get a lot of disparate activities and a lot of, you know, a lot, a lot of the times the loudest people are, you know, one token holder that is, you know, in a basement and they're, you know, under 21, right? And it's like, what do we, okay, I, I appreciate everyone having a say I appreciate the whole thesis of this, but it's been very frustrating, and that's not just for one DAO. That's probably the last five DAOs I've spoken to in the last six months. So it's been. But but a DAO doesn't um, doesn't imply any particular organization, right, or any form of organization. I mean, if you if you think about the way in which we form companies, for example. Some are very uh, collaborative and some are very hierarchical. We can do the same with DAOs, right? The only difference is, is the, the manner in, of interaction is protected and the DAO itself is unpermissioned. Beyond that, you can build any, any kind of rules, govern, and this is 
this is also the great experiment is we now have tools and, and I'll, I'll grant you the tools still don't work very well after all this time. Uh, but uh, let's suppose that we have tools. What are we going to do with them? Right. Oh, I'm going to create a DAO where I'm, I'm the kingpin. Okay, great. That's been done next. Right. But at least we're playing in the right space. We're playing in the unpermissioned permission space. But right now, we're not even doing that. Everyone is concerned about the, re the damn regulators all the time. It's, it's interesting. J JT's come off camera. That means he wants to speak. <laughs> Sorry, I uh, was a bit late today. Yeah, uh, look, I've seen DAOs uh, um, appearing right from the beginning, you know, uh, the concepts, etc. And over the last many years that I've been in this space, um, I haven't seen a DAO that works properly. Okay, so I'm with Elliot on this. I, I've been quite disappointed, actually, you know, because I thought, in principle, I, you know, it's it's like Elliot said, it's all wonderful, you know. Practically, th those DAOs majority were created just to pump a token, okay, <laughs> and then the people yeah. with more tokens are the ones who are gonna do the voting, uh, you know, on paper. Yeah, nobody votes. You know, it's very hard to to actually make it happen, you know? And then even if all the uh, the rules are stipulated and these other rules and so on, you know, people ended up doing other stuff. The DAO is just there, you know? People are gonna do other projects, people are gonna make money, people are gonna trade, whatever. And the DAO just fades away. I haven't seen a, a, a DAO that works really, really well. So far, yeah, so far, you know, the concept is great, but I think it's very impractical, you know, and and I'm not even going to the, the, the legal part of it, you know, and I, I can't see, I can't, literally, I can't see any government in the world uh, putting into law or properly into law, because there's some attempts out there, um, that those a DAO becomes a company and there's nobody responsible, you know? It's uh, just not going to happen, you know? That, that, but that's, that's, that's exactly the point, right? This is, this is the great value, is that, that we don't need the permission of any government. It is oh, merely yes, you a do. mechanism. Uh, you see, yes, you do. Anarchism, right. anarchy, anarchism says that, you know? We don't need permission from every government. We don't need any government. You know, it's just in reality, that doesn't happen. You live in a country. Yeah, the country has laws, so you have to uh, abide by those laws, you know. So if a, a country says there is an enterprise of some kind and a DAO is defined, it doesn't matter what you say, in the end it will be defined as an enterprise, yeah. You have to have, you have to fit it within those legal mechanisms in that country, yeah. If you don't, then, you know, any member of the DAO will be in serious trouble at some point, you know? And that's the point. Well, I mean, the United States government um, can rule whatever it wants to rule, right? So one of the rules that they've made, for example, is any foreign company that has, let's say, um, uh, at least, I think, 25% uh, of its membership is American, is going to be considered an American company even though it was chartered under a different jurisdiction altogether and all this kind of stuff. Okay, fine. So they can, they can say that. And now they have the following problem. How do they know that, uh, that there is 25% majority by an American, right? Well, it has to be these rules upon foreign governments. Okay, some of that works, right? There's the 13 nice nations or the Five Eyes Nations, and they all agree, and they all cross, cross information and stuff. But then there's Russia. Russia doesn't tell me anything, right? So when you, when you say that uh, you live in a country and you have to abide by the rules of that country, I'm going to say that sounds nominally correct, but uh, the reality is far more nuanced. Than uh, I find it ironic, Eric, that it sounds like you're chopping out at the moment. So I don't know if there's a, one of the Five Eyes Nation superpowers is intentionally hitting your network. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Yeah, I, uh, oh, I know what it is because, um, sorry about that, guys. 
uh, it's because I'm I'm walking away from my Wi-Fi router, so it has dropped me. <laughs> now I'm on LTE. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, I, it's it's because there are powers at work that don't want you to talk about decentralization. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, decentralization <laughs> is great, you know. You know very well, Gary, that I'm pro right from yeah. the beginning of Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, since I read the paper, the white paper, you know, and. But that's not the point. I'm very much into all of that and the pin and all the stuff happening, you know. Um, but, you know, in reality, you have to look at DAOs. And, in, you know, when you look at DAOs and everything has happened so far until now, you start to scratch your head, you know. And the reason ends up always going to be operations, you know, which country, you know, who are the people involved, you, you know, it's not going to happen. There's no more an anonymity. That's when it started, you know, when crypto started. But from 2020, 2021 onwards, things have changed a uh, lot. And there's uh, nowhere to hide, you know, uh, anymore. I, I think that's the interesting thing that DAOs and the technology allow a lot of potential, providing it's allowed. And it, it, it does it does come back to the the permission philosophy that Eric was talking about. That we, we are somewhat constrained at the moment by m maybe our psychological constructs of an acceptance that we're ruled by somebody, and we don't always know by who or whatever. So that's kind of interesting, folks. It, it's kind of on the hour, which, which is a shame because, as is always the case. Oh. I have to close this call off now, uh, just as we get to a really interesting bit. The, the, this seems to be the one default setting with the, this group that um, we, we always start getting into and a really interesting topic just at the point at which you want to close it off. But I, I just wanted to finish to say th thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, Elliot, it was nice to see you on board. Uh, Eric, good to see you back again. Anna or Mugly, um, safe travels back to Zurich or, or wherever. Uh, good to join Elena. Thanks to you. for anyone who's watching afterwards. Hope you enjoyed it. Something a bit different. Right, uh, so <laughs> really, really good film. Thank, thanks everyone for joining in. Have a great day. Thank Bye you. now. Take care, guys.